why Muslims are Muslims and not Christians. Regarding the Bible, the Muslim believes that the truth of God is to be found in the Bible, but doesn't mean that everything in the Bible is the truth of God. We do find in the Bible the teaching that God is one, the teaching of the prophets, the teaching of the law. But we find a great deal as well, which appears to be written by the hand of man. The next of our speakers will be Dr. Lawrence Brown from the USA, addressing us on the topic of why are Muslims Muslims and not Christians? A brief background of the speaker, Dr. Lawrence Brown is a graduate from two Ivy League universities with subspecialty training in ophthalmology. Dr. Brown served as a respected ophthalmologist in the US Air Force for a period of eight years. His term of service was distinguished by earning the position of Chief of Ophthalmology, both at Lackenheath Air Force Base in England and Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Lawrence Brown received his BA from Cornell University, his MD from Brown University Medical School, and his ophthalmology residency training at George Washington University Hospital in Washington, D.C. He now lives in the holy city of Medina, Saudi Arabia where he continues his work as a medical director and subspecialist in cornea, cataracts, glaucoma and refractive surgery and also writes for a pastime. So I invite to the podium to address us on the topic of why are Muslims Muslims and not Christians, Dr. Lawrence Brown from the USA. USA. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah ma'abad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The talk that I am going to give today about why Muslims are Muslims and not Christians is relevant because as the Director of Interfaith Affairs for the Canadian Dawah Association, I attend interfaith conferences where this question often comes up. It comes up because whenever you have a group of people of different religions together, there is always one unanswered question that sort of hovers in the air. It's a question that everybody wants to ask, but nobody ever does, and as a result, it never gets answered. And the question that people want to ask is they want to ask, why aren't you, meaning the audience, the same as me in reference to their religion? Now we find this in our personal lives as well. We are frequently speaking with others of different religions. And it's common for the Christian to run wonder why this person that they are talking with is not Christian. In the same way that we as Muslims wonder, why is this person not a Muslim? In explaining why we as Muslims have chosen Islam as our religion, we accomplish a number of things. Number one, we defend our own faith. Number two, we inform others about our choice, which is valuable because it informs them not only about why we are Muslim, it informs them about why they should be Muslim. So let me begin by just mentioning that everything that I say today can be found on my websites and in my books. My websites are leveltruth.com and eighthscroll.com. So any information that I give, there's no need to take notes. It can be found there. Again, that's 8thscroll, 
spelled exactly as it sounds, E-I-G-H-T-H, scroll, S-C-R-O-L-L, dot com. The second website is leveltruth.com, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H, dot com. So, to begin with, when we are asked, why are we Muslim? Why are you not Christian or any other religion? The simple, straightforward answer is simply that as Muslims, we believe in God as one God and Muhammad, peace be upon him, as his final prophet. However, to answer the question in depth to the Christian audience, we have to point out that the Muslim perspective on the Bible and on Jesus Christ and on Christian doctrine is important and unique in its understanding. Regarding the Bible, the Muslim believes that the truth of God is to be found in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that everything in the Bible is the truth of God. We do find in the Bible the teaching that God is one the teaching of the prophets, the teaching of the law. But we find a great deal as well, which appears to be written by the hand of man. So, how do we address this issue? To begin with, we point out that the Bible is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Nobody knows. It does not exist as far as anybody knows. The Bible is a collection of writings that are translated from ancient manuscripts. In fact, at this time, as of last counting, we have approximately 5,700 manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament. 5,700. Now, if you have 5,700 manuscripts of the same document, you would expect that among that group of literature, some of them would agree. The fact of the matter is, out of 5,700 manuscripts, no two manuscripts agree in all of their particulars. So what this means is that although we have 5,700 manuscripts, they are all different in small or big ways from one another. There are no two that agree with one another in every particular. Now, the most ancient manuscripts, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, date from the 4th century. So in addition to the fact that we have this huge volume of manuscripts which do not agree with one another in all details, in addition to that, the oldest and most reliable texts are over 300 years older than the time of the mission of Jesus Christ. They were scribed, they were written over 300 years after the time of the mission of Jesus Christ. What can happen in 300 years? A lot. We find that in these manuscripts, errors were introduced in the form of additions, deletions, substitutions, modifications, most commonly just in letters and words, but frequently in entire verses. According to Metzger, one of the greatest uh, scholars of textual criticism, Quote, numerous changes and accretions came into the text with the result that, quote, all known witnesses of the New Testament are, to a greater or lesser extent, mixed texts, and even several of the earliest manuscripts are not free from egregious errors, huge errors. The interpreter's Bible of the dictionary states, quote, it is safe to say that there is not one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscript tradition is wholly uniform. 
J. Enoch Powell, another biblical scholar regarding the book of Matthew, quote, at the cost of sometimes severe disruption, wherever they appear, passages about John the Baptist have been inserted. According to Powell, quote, it is in fact possible that all the long discourses put into the mouth of Jesus are artificially introduced, end quote. This would, of course, include the great sermon, the missionary charge, every long passage attributed to Jesus Christ. Now, in misquoting Jesus, Bart D. Ehrman stated that the specific passages of the woman taken in adultery, the last 12 verses of Mark, were added by later scribes. Furthermore, these examples quote, represent just two out of how many? Tens? Out of hundreds? No. These examples, quote, represent just two out of thousands of places in which the manuscripts of the New Testament came to be changed by scribes. In fact, entire books of the Bible were forged. Which books were forged? Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 and 2 Peter, and Jude. Count them. That is 9 out of 27. That is a full one-third of the books of the New Testament that are now judged by biblical scholars. By Muslim biblical scholars? No. By Christian biblical scholars to be forged. Now, we have to admit that being forged doesn't mean that it's wrong, but I'll tell you what, it sure doesn't mean that it's right, and it most certainly does not mean that it's from God. As Ehrman tells us, quote, most scholars today have abandoned the identifications of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why is this? We have just discussed the fact that nine out of 27 books in the New Testament are judged by modern Christian scholars as being forged. So which books in the Bible can we rely upon, if any? If we speak to the Christian scholars on this point, we will get different answers. If we speak to Christian laity, they will say, well, of course, the Gospels. The Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All Christians depend upon the Gospels more than any other writings in the Bible. Unfortunately, all four of the Gospels are anonymous. The authorship is anonymous. Modern Christian scholarship tells us that we do not know who wrote these Gospels. They were not signed. They were not attributed to any particular author. Hence the comment by scholars such as Bart D. Ehrman, quote, most scholars today have abandoned these identifications and recognized that the books were written by otherwise unknown but relatively well-educated, Greek-speaking and writing Christians during the second half of the first century. Robert Funk, the head of the Jesus Seminar, a seminar of 300 leading Christian scholars, not a sole scholar. Quote, the Gospels, unlike most Greco-Roman writings, are anonymous. The familiar headings which give the name of an author, the Gospel according to, were not part of the original manuscripts, for they were added only early in the second century. Added by whom? By unknown figures in the early church. In most cases, the names are guesses or perhaps the result of pious wishes. My words? No. His words. Again, I'm going to read the passage. Who added the names? Quote, by unknown figures in the early church, in most cases, the names are guesses or perhaps the result of pious wishes. According to Ehrman, 
quote, Moses did not write the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not write the Gospels. Furthermore, quote, of the 27 books of the New Testament, only eight almost certainly go back to the author whose name they bear, the seven undisputed letters of Paul and the revelation of John, although we don't know which John this was. So, only Matthew and John, in the first case, were disciples anyway. If we look at our Bibles, we find that the verses of Luke 6, 14 through 16, and Matthew 10, 2 through 4, enumerate the lists of the disciples. Luke and Mark do not make the lists. So even if the Gospels were written by those upon whose name they are labeled, Luke and Mark were not true disciples. There is good reason to believe that John did not write John and Matthew did not write Matthew, even though they were disciples. What are those good reasons? Well, one of the good reasons is that it is recorded in Christian sources that John the disciple died on or around 98 CE. However, the gospel was written in 110. This is not according to Muslim scholars. This is according to Christian scholars. Acts 4.13 tells us that John and Peter were, quote, unlettered, illiterate. How can you write a gospel if you are unlettered? To this end, Graham Stanton poses a compelling question. Quote, was the eventual decision to accept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John correct? Today it is generally agreed that neither Matthew nor John was written by an apostle, and Mark and Luke may not have been associates of the apostles. Professor Barty Ehrman is even more direct. Quote, Critical scholars are fairly united today in thinking that Matthew did not write the first gospel or John the fourth, that Peter did not write two Peter and possibly not one Peter, no other book of the New Testament, no other book of the New Testament claims to be written by one of Jesus' earthly disciples. There are books by the Apostle of Paul, of course. Thirteen go by his name in the New Testament, at least seven of which are accepted by nearly all scholars as authentic. Read between the lines. He is saying 13 of Paul's books, out of those 13, seven are accepted as authentic. What does that say about the other six? It is saying that the other six are not accepted as authentic. Six out of 13, basically half. Regarding copying errors, we have to expect that most were unintentional, many were inconsequential, but all the same, Barty Ehrman tells us that many others were not only deliberate, but they were significant. In fact, they were doctrinally motivated. And this is the scriptural alteration that we care about. Because if we find that the scriptures have been altered according to doctrinal motivation, we have to understand that this is the judgment of a human being, not the strict, faithful recording of revelation from God. Let's look at some examples. If we look at those verses which appear not only to be altered, but in fact transformed, look first at Acts 8, 37. Does anybody know what Acts 8, 37 says? Has anybody ever read Acts 8, 37 in the Bible? I will answer for you. No. Nobody knows. And with relative certainty, I can say nobody here has read it. Why? Because it's empty. 
Any Bible you pick up, you will find that it lists 837 in its numbers. It goes 836, 837, 838, but 837 is left blank. Why? Because it is so well recognized among scholars that Acts 837 was an insertion that they do not even translate it. Similarly, Acts 1534 is enumerated, but because it is unquestionably inserted by copyists, the judgment of Bruce Metzger, it is not translated in any of the modern faithful Bibles. Are these two lone examples? No. Matthew 17, 21, 18, 11, Mark 7, 16, 9, 44, 9, 46, 11, 26, part of Luke 9, 56, 17, 36, 23, 17. Don't copy all of this down. It's all in my notes. You will find it on my websites. But the fact is, whether you are looking at the first epistle of John, whether you are looking at John 5, 1, Romans 16, 24, you will find that these verses are enumerated and all or part of them are not translated. Why? Because modern Christian scholarship has recognized that they are undeniably insertions by a copyist. And if we recognize that those verses are insertions, how can we trust any others? Now, despite all the evidence to the contrary, many Christians will still say, well, but the Bible is the Word of God. You can present all of the evidence that I have presented, and you will still find some Christians who have been raised upon the thought to believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and they cannot let go of the concepts that they have been indoctrinated to believe. Is there any hard and fast? undeniable proof that the Bible is not wholly the Word of God. Yes, there is. And it comes from